Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. The term crisis in cosmology has been used so routinely over the last couple of decades. I have to wonder if its significance is beginning to dull in the public consciousness. When science journalists use the term, they're generally describing the countless scientific discoveries that contradict or undermine Big Bang cosmology. Of course, for decades now, numerous scientific studies have shown an apparent discordancy between the so-called expansion rate in the, quote, early universe after the hypothetical Big Bang and the expansion rate in the, quote, later universe. Well, just in the last couple of weeks, the Keck Observatory issued a press release reporting the most reliable verification to date that the discordancy is real and the rate of acceleration of the universe's expansion is too great for standard cosmology to explain. But of course, the crisis in cosmology goes much deeper than problems with the expanding universe. It seems that just about every week, we hear about the existence of objects from stars to galaxies to quasars to superclusters, as well as a host of celestial phenomena that, quote, can't exist in the Big Bang universe. And even more fundamentally, they shouldn't exist in a universe where gravity and gravity alone dominates. If you follow this series, you've seen reports on these discoveries ad nauseum, and we'll be exploring several of these specific discoveries as we continue in this new discussion. So today, we're going to be discussing all of this and more with the Chief Science Advisor to the Thunderbolts Project, Wal Thornhill. I can tell you at the outset that this is going to be at least a two-part or even a three-part presentation, because for several months now, there have been too many blockbuster discoveries for us to adequately cover, which are incredibly important for the electric universe and plasma cosmology. But before we begin addressing these items one by one, I'd like us to begin with a discussion on the very foundations of Big Bang cosmology to clarify some essential distinctions between scientific fact and scientific theory. What is known versus what is believed. For instance, new scientists recently published the collection 17 More Things You Need to Understand, in which it outlines what it describes as, quote, six principles of physics. And again, the reader might assume that each of these principles is an established fact, or a, quote, law of physics. While you introduced me to this new scientist piece, so why don't you begin by explaining what you think it reveals about the current state of cosmology and the culture of science? Yeah, that new scientist special starts off with uh, the first chapter is on mathematics instead of physics. You would think that if you're talking about cosmology, the first thing you need to talk about is the model, the cosmological model, the physical model, before you start talking about the mathematics that you're going to apply. They've got it sort of backwards, you know, the cart before the horse. And then the very second one talks about the Big Bang. <laughs> The very nature of the Big Bang should sound alarm bells because uh, what we observe in the universe is pretty much a balance. The solar system works like clockwork. There's no ex gravitational explanation for the beauty of spiral galaxies, and yet they seem to be a standard form of galaxies. So just the very nature of the observations suggests that using an expl or something equivalent to an explosion, a Big Bang in the beginning, it, there's something desperately wrong. And as one philosopher wrote, and I read just recently, he said that only an idiot would design a universe with an unbalanced force. And gravity is an unbalanced force. It's only ever attractive. It's never repulsive, according to our experience on Earth. But then we extrapolate our experience on Earth out into the deep space, <laughs> and it doesn't work. It only works within the solar system. But even then, uh, when you go back to Newton, Newton also considered that gravity was a balanced force. He looked at it as a repulsive force as well. And it does work, but nobody could figure out just how that might be physically. And so that's been ignored ever since. It wasn't until Halton Up came along and showed that his balanced universe absolutely needed 
a balanced force. Gravity must be a repulsive force on the cosmic scale. And that was one of the key issues that the electric universe had to deal with, was how can we explain gravity as a balanced force? And as soon as you do that, all of the requirements for a Big Bang go away. You don't need anything to separate matter in the beginning because the result of that separation is either it all falls back together again or it all continues to expand forever. It's almost impossible to have it just expand to a certain point and then sit there. So this was uh, you know, a major problem with the Big Bang theory right from the very beginning. The other thing is that all of the lack of real physics in describing how the Big Bang originated. For instance, if you look at Wiki, <laughs> that infamous source of information, it was created from a singularity, which was described as a very hot, small and dense superforce. In other words, the mix of four fundamental forces with no stars, atoms, form or structure. Now, this is physically meaningless. Singularities by their very definition, involve the concept of infinity, which isn't a number. So you can't add, subtract, multiply or divide by infinity and come up with a number other than zero, and that only as an approximation in the case of division. Singularities in a model are clear evidence that the model has failed. So right at the very fundamental level, we're not doing physics. And then again, we look at uh, Wiki's explanation, to be hot, requires energetic particles. That's how we measure heat. It's a measure of the kinetic energy of particles. That means that the singularity had to have the matter there already in this infinitely small <laughs> point in space. Right. This schoolboy howler results from energy being undefined in modern physics. There's no such thing as pure energy. It's always in relation to matter. It's a gaping hole dug by Einstein and his relativity theory where any arbitrarily moving observer can be considered at rest at the center of the universe. In other words, you've all got your own, you're all the center of your own universe. And that's obvious nonsense because movement of any of these observers is a form of energy. So Einstein removed the absolute reference frame of the fixed stars, that is the rest of the universe, which was required by all the great physicists of the preceding centuries, including Newton. And then they talk about this singularity being small, but that's meaningless compared to what? It's a concept you can get by dividing any number by infinity. Then it goes on and assumes there are four fundamental forces. Well, this is uh, a product of not understanding the physics in the first place. The electric universe, on the other hand, needs only one, the electric force, and then magnetism and gravity and the nuclear forces are all described in terms of the response of orbiting matter to an external electric force, or in the case of an atom, the internal electric force, if the nucleus is offset from the centre. And then the last thing that it talks about is this force being dense. Now, any force requires the presence of matter before the Big Bang. So once again, we've got matter having to be there before the Big Bang. And how can a force be dense? Matter can be dense. A force only has meaning in the presence of matter, which again, isn't there before creation. If it were, the singularity would be a black hole, one of these imaginary black holes from which matter can't escape. So <laughs> it could never bang. You look at the electric universe over the past decade or so and Steve Crothers' analysis of the mathematics, and the mathematics doesn't work either. It uses a, a pseudo-tensor, which in Steve's words is just a, a meaningless jumble of symbols. It has no physical significance. The Big Bang is sheer nonsense. It has nothing to do with real science. What started the worship of an expanding universe? In 1929, Edwin Hubble discovered that for fairly local galaxies in his field of view, the fainter they are, the higher their redshift, assumed to be due to the Doppler effect. In other words, the change in frequency of a signal as it recedes from you drops in frequency, and that's a redshift in light. Anyway, Hubble himself remained unconvinced that the Doppler effect correctly explained his observations. He felt that uh, the science underpinning, you know, this physical model was lacking. There's something else involved. It was left up to Halton Arp, who worked at, at one point with Hubble, 
to discover intrinsic redshift, which means that the objects themselves have a different energy, a lower energy, which means that both the uh, particles within each atom, the protons and the electrons, have a, a different mass, slightly lower. And that difference in mass means that the frequency of light that they emit will be shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. It's as simple as that. We just assume, we, we make measurements of the mass of the proton and the mass of the electron in laboratories on Earth and then put it in a physics standards manual. And everyone assumes it's the same throughout the universe. It's merely an assumption. And in the case of the uh, redshift, the very fact that Helton Art was able to find that it was quantized, in other words, this is a subatomic effect, this is a quantum effect, and we observe it in galactic scale objects, means that the whole underpinning of particle physics as well is based on nonsensical ideas. This idea that the quantum theory only applies to the uh, atomic and subatomic scale is incorrect. So trying to find the answers to everything through particle physics and cosmology fails on that very foundation. The New Scientist article, which is supposed to be giving us answers to the 17 big questions, when it comes to uh, cosmology, it talks about the principles of physics. Now, one of the principles of physics that is crucial is that you cannot create or annihilate matter because that constitutes a miracle. We have no idea how matter is constructed or how you would go about constructing it, what the constituent parts are, and what happens if you were to discombobulate you know, a proton or an electron. What would these particles be and uh, where would they go? How would we detect them? None of this is answered. When we come to uh, what the new scientist puts forward as the six principles of physics, none of them have anything to do with this basic problem. The first one says... The speed of light is a constant. Who says so? When we measure the speed of light, it's always in a medium. And to say, as Einstein did, that there is no ether in the vacuum of space is sheer nonsense. You cannot transmit an electromagnetic signal through nothing. It has to be a polarizable medium. And we measure the polarizable medium and give it capacitive you know, dielectric uh, properties, which is what's needed. So there is an ether. The speed of light, we know, depends on the density of the ether that it's travelling through, what its speed will be. The speed of light is not a constant. And this was made crystal clear when Rupert Sheldrake spoke to us at one of our conferences a few years ago, and he pointed out that it's acknowledged that when they measured the speed of light, it varied. So what's been done? They now define the metre, the measurement of distance, in terms of the speed of light and made it a constant. They've fixed it. <laughs> this is unscientific and in fact uh, can lead to serious problems. The second item is the equivalence principle, the equivalence between the sensation of gravity and the sensation of being accelerated in a lift. They are not equivalent. Gravity is, despite the formula which talks about a center of gravity, is an effect, a force, between all matter in the universe. So in the case of the Earth, that's distributed throughout the volume of the Earth. So the force on a person accelerating away from the Earth will change. It will be different to what you would experience in an elevator. They are not equivalent. The cosmological principle is just another assumption based on observation, and it may or may not be true. When you look at Helton Arp's different perspective on the universe, we are only a small part of the universe that is of unknown age and unknown extent. So all we can say is that in our local visible universe, part of the universe, the cosmological principle appears to hold, but there is a lot of structure, and so the structure is unexpected. That is the filamentary structure of the universe. It's not expected in the gravitational model, unless you add dark matter and all sorts of other magical fairy dust. But in the electrical model, that is absolutely necessary because of the formation of stars and galaxies along cosmological Berkeley and current filaments. So the filamentary nature is actually prima facie evidence that the electrical universe model is correct. Quantization is the next one, number four. 
And uh, of course, quantum theory, as Richard Feynman famously said, nobody understands it. And that is correct. Nobody understands it because there is no physical model underpinning it. The electric universe deals with that in terms of resonant behavior of structured subatomic particles. The electric universe merely repeats the pattern of the atom because they're closest together in scale as an orbital system and repeats that for the electron and the proton and says that they're orbital systems as well. And therefore they will exchange energy in discrete resonant ways. You can only exchange energy between stable orbits. The other thing is that the foundational work for these stable orbits comes from Wilhelm Weber 150 years ago. So the foundations of the electric universe are that old. It's just that no one was paying attention at the time. And <laughs> his work was in German. Although Faraday and Maxwell knew about it, they preferred their field theories to ones which involved real particles and uh, an instantaneous electric force. But of course, this is a real physical model. This is one that relies on physics. Quantum theory of Niels Bohr is a statistical theory. In other words, <laughs> anything is possible. You know, lies, damn lies, and statistics. You can dream of anything you like. And this is where the uncertainty principle comes from. Because it's a statistical model, you can be uncertain about where a particle is and what it's doing. In the electrical model, there are real particles in real space, in real time. The whole thing remains coherent simply because we're dealing with real time. None of this relativity nonsense of malleable clocks and distances. The wave particle duality comes about also from this problem of not understanding matter interactions at this structured subatomic level, because there is no such thing as a photon. You cannot have a, a particle with no mass, which is what the photon is defined as being, traveling at the speed of light. No, light is a wave phenomenon, but the particles involved in that wave are communicating with one another instantaneously. So all of these strange so-called non-locality and spooky quantum effects are just the order of the day in the electrical model of uh, Wilhelm Weber and particle interactions. He also showed that there are stable orbits in those electrodynamic interactions. It's nothing to do with electrostatics, it's electrodynamic. Not one of these six items is a fundamental principle of physics. So you start from that basis, you've got nowhere to go, really. Uh, they're just stories that have been made up to try and make it appear as though we have a cosmology. At present, modern cosmology is not science. It's merely a story, and it gets more and more complicated as time goes on.